and welcome to this social policy taster from the University of Kent. Uh, I appreciate this is a bit weird. Normally we'd be sat in a room doing this. Uh, I'd be talking to you, making eye contact. There'd be opportunities to ask questions and things like that. But obviously the current circumstances mean that that can't be the case. Now, what I'm going to do here is not tell you about the social policy course at Kent. There are plenty of other places for you to get that information and you're more than welcome to email me to ask. Instead, what I'm going to do is give you a bit of a taster session of some of the content you'd get delivered to you if you come and study social policy at the University of Kent. So what I'm going to cover in this 15 minute or so presentation is the National Citizen Service. Now, many of you might have done National Citizen Service. If you haven't done it yourselves, you might have friends who've done it. You might be aware of it. So hopefully this is a policy idea that is very real to you and to your experiences. I'm going to talk about how this policy idea came to be and how it's been implemented. So just a quick overview of what I'm going to do. I'm going to begin by talking about what the National Citizen Service is. You may know all this already, so I won't dwell on it too long. And then we'll spend some time talking about the policy drivers behind it, essentially where the idea for National Citizen Service came from. And then we're going to look at the academic knowledge to see whether this was a good idea, whether when we look at the evidence, this is the right way in which to get young people engaging and interacting more in their communities. And finally, I'm going to look at whether it works as a policy. So the National Citizen Service is a four phase programme was launched by David Cameron in 2011 by the coalition government that he led and aimed at young people aged between 15 and 17. Mostly aimed at people in the year they finished their GCSEs. So that summer when you've done your GCSEs, the long summers stretching out ahead of you and National Citizen Service was essentially set to fill that gap. And it's funded by central government and costs really quite a lot of money. It had £1.5 billion of government funding between 2011 and 2020. That's an awful lot of money. And around half a million young people have taken part so far. That started small the first few years. There was only 10,000 or so people doing it, whereas now those numbers are much higher, but by no means all of the young people in that post-GCSE summer do it. For the young people who take part in National Citizen Service, it only costs them £50. So the bulk of the payment for it is coming from government with young people and their families making a fairly token contribution. And there's even a scheme whereby if you can't afford the £50, you'll get that funded. So the idea is that this is inclusive for everyone, that anyone can take part. And it has four phases. The first is adventure. The idea of the adventure is it's something that's fun, that's potentially different, that takes young people out of their comfort zone. Second phase is discovery, where the young people on the scheme take part in uh, things to boost their life skills. Often this might be partnered with a university or some kind of further education college to develop skills in that respect. The third section is something called social action, which essentially normally boils down to a volunteering or fundraising project that the young people take part in as groups. And then the fourth phase uh, is a celebration, and this one is not entirely clear to me. Um, but it often seems that this is merely just a kind of event and it might not even be straight away. It might be weeks or months after the main kind of block of three chunks have finished. Now these phases each, apart from the last one, take about a week. So you're looking at about a three week programme, give or take, that young people are engaging in. So, policy drivers. Uh, think back to 2011, probably for many of you, you were still at primary school, but we had a new government. Coalition government came into power in 2010 with this big idea called the Big Society. And the idea of the Big Society was that government shouldn't be doing everything for people. I don't think it ever was, but that's not the point. And that instead, people should be doing more for themselves and each other. So this was David Cameron's big philosophical political idea. A National Citizen Service slotted into that neatly, particularly the phase of it around social action, among young people having those key skills from phase two and using them to make a difference in their communities in phase three. So Mycock and Tung, two authors who definitely had to have their names that way around, say that the motivations for National Citizen Service lie in an organic view of society, whereby citizens and communities 
cohere through volunteerism and participation, enhancing a sense of belonging that leads to greater civic participation. And you can be, you can be forgiven for thinking, what on earth are they on about there? And that's fair enough. I study this stuff for a living and I'm kind of thinking, what on earth are they on about there? Because for all the rhetoric about an organic civil society, stuff coming up from the bottom, this was a big government project. They spent one and a half million pounds, sorry, one and a half billion pound on this. This is hardly organic. This is hardly grassroots coming up from the bottom. This is a big government scheme. It's not big society. It's a big government scheme. So I think you can be uh, forgiven for being somewhat sceptical about the idea that the philosophical roots of it lay in these organic ideas of civil society. So where do we look? Where can we find what the ideas that lead to this are? Well, we need to look a little bit further back. During World War I and World War II, we had something called conscription in the UK. Conscription is the compulsory enlistment of people in national service. So now, if you want to join the army, if you want to join the navy, you sign up. It's a, a career choice that you sign up to. You make that decision. And of course, most of us decide not to do that. That wasn't the case during World War I and World War II. If you were a male of a certain age, you had to join up. You were conscripted to engage in military service. And that wasn't just during the wartime. In fact, after the Second World War ended, conscription carried on for a fairly decent period of time. So post the Second World War, healthy young men aged 17 to 21 were expected to serve in the armed forces for 18 months. Now, some of you watching this video will be healthy young men aged 17 to 21. So not that long ago, so probably not within your parents' lifetimes, but maybe within your grandparents' lifetimes, they would have been required to serve in the armed forces for 18 months. In 1950, this was increased to two years. That's quite a big chunk. Think back to what you were doing two years ago. You were probably getting ready for your GCSE exams. That's quite a big chunk of time. I'm sure that seems a long time ago. Well, that's how long you'd have had to be in the army in that period. And this lasted quite a long time. It was gradually phased out between 1957 and 1960. Now, that's not in real terms all that long ago. So the idea of conscription, the idea of young people doing this, or young men doing this short period of military service, is quite in the recent memory of certain people. So Michael Caine, actor, Italian job, among other things, said in response to various concerns about what young people were doing in 2009, I'm just saying, put them in the army for six months. You're there to learn how to defend your country. You belong to the country. Then when you come out, you have a sense of belonging rather than a sense of violence. Now, we can pick apart all night, and I would quite gladly pick apart the idea that training people to kill will give them a sense of belonging rather than a sense of violence. But this idea clearly had traction. It would be simple to see it as an old man yelling at a crowd, cloud, as The Simpsons tells us, but he wasn't alone. Joanna Lumley, another entertainer of a similar age, I just think that we ought to be doing more. We expect people to do nothing. We expect people to carry knives. We expect people to be afraid. We've gone down the wrong alley. I love the idea of having some sort of national service. Now, I mean, I may have rose-tinted spectacles here, but I certainly don't expect young people to be carrying knives. Uh, but nonetheless, again, these ideas, they had traction. And again, it would be easy to dismiss it by saying, OK, boomer, yeah, whatever, your ideas aren't relevant to us. But people pick up on it. People listen. It's not just these few old celebrities. These views are shared by the majority of British people, or rather, the majority of British men. So uh, according to some research done by the polling organisation YouGov in 2016, 49% of people, almost exactly half, felt that national service, that young people having to do national service would reduce crime rates. But demographics play a big old role there. 62% of male, sorry, of conservative voters think that men should have to do national service, compared to only 38% of Labour and Liberal Democrat voters. The same, proportion, the same pattern, but in similar proportions, exist for thinking women should do national service as well. 
and 62% of those aged over 60 support male national service, compared to just 23% of 18 to 24-year-olds, the ones who would actually help to do it, but more against it, perhaps unsurprisingly. Now, what do we know about people who vote for conservative governments like the one that David Cameron was trying to form? Well, we know that they are Tory voters, fairly obviously. We also know that they are more likely to be older. So by doing something that sounded a bit like national service, that looked a bit like national service, David Cameron was very much playing to his base. He was playing to the sort of person who votes for his party, and that's good politics, right? You want people to vote for you, so you make policies that will be attractive to them. So that's what national citizen service was. Now, again, it would be easy to say, OK, boomer, right? Who cares? Right? We're the young people who have to go and do this national service. Why should we care what older people are thinking we should do? But older people vote. Younger people, they don't so much. So these ideas, they get popular and they get voted in. Now, David Cameron was in a tricky situation because no politician wants to bring back national service. No politician, certainly no sensible politician, thinks the idea that enlisting young people in the military for a period of time is a good idea. Certainly not compulsory. But there was a significant body of his voters who thought it was a good idea. So he was stuck. He didn't know what to do. So before they were elected, David Cameron and for some reason also Michael Caine proposed the National Citizen Service in response to these concerns. They proposed this idea of young people doing a kind of rite of passage uh, scheme at the end of their, at that time, compulsory schooling, so the end of GCSEs, was a good idea. And the media celebrated this as though national service was being brought back, as though young people were going back into the military for a compulsory period. This wasn't the case. They were doing some adventure, some key skills and some volunteering. But nonetheless, it was framed in this way. So the Daily Express, national service plan to help lost teenagers. The Telegraph, conservatives plan civilian national service scheme. That talk, that discussion was all about military ideas of this. So the policy driver wasn't about young people doing good things in the community. It was placating a group of people who thought that national service was a way of dealing with a problem of youth. So David Cameron at the time says, I want to see a programme which engages young people, gives them a sense of purpose, optimism, belonging, something like national service, not military, not compulsory, but universal and in the same spirit. I mean, if it's not military and it's not compulsory, it's really nothing like national service. But nonetheless, this was the idea. And he went on to say, too many teenagers appear lost, feel their lives lack shape or direction. NCS will help change that. It's going to mix young people from different backgrounds in a way that doesn't happen right now. It's going to teach them what it means to be socially responsible. There are so many assumptions going on here that I'm sure don't reflect your lives or the lives of people you know. But nonetheless, this is where policy was being driven from. And again, Mycock and Tung say military undertones were apparent, with Cameron asserting it would be a way of learning respect for our country and each other, just like national service. So you couldn't escape the military overtones of this policy. So essentially what we have is a policy that wasn't designed because of evidence, it wasn't designed because this seemed like something that was going to be helpful, it was designed for political reasons because this was a way of placating a group of people who were worried about something that didn't have an easy solution. It's funny then because it's not actually an awful idea. Music and Wilson, who wrote a, uh, a really key textbook on volunteering, say that by volunteering early in life, people acquire experience and skills that lay the groundwork for volunteering in later life. It's not surprising, really. We know that we learn when we're young, and one of the things we learn is how to engage in communities, how to engage with one another and to give our time freely. So if you get young people doing it who wouldn't necessarily normally do it, that has to be a good thing. And we know that young people's volunteering bears the imprint of parental influence. There's been lots and lots of different studies that show that if your parents volunteer, you are more likely to volunteer. They come home, they talk about it, you discuss it as a family and you see them doing it. You might even go with them. So we know that it's passed down through families. Now, what to do if your family doesn't volunteer? 
do we just write those people off? You're only going to volunteer if your parents do it. Well, that doesn't seem particularly fair. It doesn't seem a good way of sharing the benefits that volunteering has. So a scheme that gets young people from all sorts of backgrounds involved in doing something for their community seems like a good idea. So it might not be an awful policy. It might actually be quite a decent policy. But none of the reasons behind it were because of these strong academic reasons. They were because of a political game to try and placate a particular group of people by doing something that looked and sounded a little bit like national service. So does it work? Well, by 2016, albeit a little while ago now, but when the most recent evaluation was done, 12% of those eligible to do it were doing the programme. Doesn't sound like very many, but that's a decent chunk of the kind of 700,000-ish people who did their GCSEs that year. That's a pretty decent chunk of people. And overall, the group of people who did NCS were more diverse than the population as a whole. They were a little bit more female, but they were also a little bit more from ethnic minorities, a little bit more from those with who have free school meals, which is our, our best measure of, of kind of deprivation and poverty, um, and a little bit more uh, young people with special educational needs. This seems a good thing, right? We're getting the people who otherwise might be underrepresented in volunteering. That seems fairly positive. So what about the results of the programme? Well, in three to five months after the programme, when young people were asked about how it had changed their attitudes, 80% felt more positive to those from different backgrounds, and 50% were more likely to help in their local area. Now, that seems pretty good. That seems like progress. That's pretty good findings, pretty good outcomes for society. But it's also pretty short term. So 16 months later, only 58% of young people felt more positive to people from different backgrounds. And only 38% were more likely to help in their local area. So we see quite a significant drop off. It would appear that one three week block, the end of your GCSEs, isn't enough, unsurprisingly really, to really get a long term solution. There's no longer term data available than that. So what we can probably deduce from this is that if you have a grandstanding showpiece piece of volunteering uh, scheme for young people, that works for a little while. It gives good publicity in the papers, particularly make it sound a little bit like national service, but it maybe doesn't have the long-term outcomes that you would hope that your £1.5 billion might deliver. So what do we know? Well, participation is not rising quickly as expected. 2016, about 10 million of the budget went unspent. There were young people who could have done it, who were going to be paid for to do it, who didn't do it. About 13% short in total of the NCS's target, and that's even with the huge amount of money that was put into advertising and supporting people to do it. So it doesn't appear to have been as popular as the politicians maybe thought. So, to finish up. I hope what this has shown is that policy drivers, the things that make people, uh, make politicians develop policy, are complicated. You would think, you would maybe hope that policy comes about because of evidence, because of strong ideas that are supported by our knowledge and our research that become reality. It simply isn't the case. Not all policy, in fact, very little policy is evidence based. It's often based on political expediency, the things that will help politicians to win elections that sound good, that play well with their voters. And that's bad because if you're putting a lot of money into this, and £1.5 billion is a lot of money, well that's a lot of money to put into something that is essentially about public relations and looking like you're doing something. So at this stage the jury is still very much out on whether this policy is worth it and whether it's worth the money, but only by interrogating how it came about and how it's doing can we understand that? So that's why I think studying social policy is so important, because it allows us to look at how policy is designed, how it's implemented, and how effective it is. And only by doing that can we understand how society helps those who need our help and does so in the best possible and most efficient ways. So that's why I think you should come study social policy with us at the University of Kent. And if you've got any questions about that or anything else, please do not hesitate to drop me an email. Thanks very much.